getting some bite out of the the sound. It just kind of wants to be a little bit muffled and just kind of dull in general. You know, the dull blades, dull reeds, kind of like the, with knives, right? Yes. Simple, yeah. simple formula. It's and just a knife on the inside. So you want it sharp, you know. <laughs> is there like a certain number of pieces of cane that you would say the blades are expected to last through? That's a good question. Dad would always say a thousand. I don't know. I'm not sure. I think a thousand is uh, a lot. A thousand is a lot. I mean, that's, right? that's not nothing. It's not nothing. I would say less than a thousand for sure, but <laughs> oh. it, it depends. Gosh, it, it depends on so much. You know, like what kind of cane you're using, how long do you soak it? Uh, a lot of people are using these pre gougers that gouge down to like 80, let's say, in the middle. Oh, and wow. so you basically hardly have to gouge at all mm-hmm. i'd say that that um you could you could get a thousand pieces probably out of out of that if you're not gouging too much with it but um and then again it also comes down to how much of your blade is exposed because that's going to tell you how many swipes it's going to take right what was commercial how many licks does it take to get to the center of the tootsie, <laughs> tootsie roll, roll. Right? <laughs> do you recommend using a pre-gouger oh yeah sure yeah okay yeah well i'll say you know Dad made the double. I still make those just like he did. So you have the English horn on one side, oboe on the other. But, you know, it's just a planer. And so if you want to get that um, that extra little bit of gouging, pre-gouging, I guess you could say, uh, I think it's like a reeds and stuff, something like that. Mm-hmm. You know, he makes good products. So I, I like yeah. that. I like that idea a lot. And I, th- I think it's a crank through. It seems pretty safe to me and it does a good job cutting. Now, is there a particular kind of cane or shaper tip that you would recommend using with your machine? I I just use Rigotti because it's cheap, you know. And, <laughs> okay. I mean, you know, I got to throw, <laughs> let's just be honest, I got to throw a lot of it away because yeah. it's crooked or too big or whatever. But it, it makes a quick read, which I love. I make quick reads and I want to go and play them right away. Yeah. I had some really good Donati that I just went through about a year ago that made like every piece was a good read. Wow. Oh, it was good. And then let's see, our oh, our former associate principal uh, basically gave me a whole bunch of geese after she quit. I mean, like a burlap sack, like 14 pounds of it. Oh, my God. <laughs> some of it was phenomenal. Uh-huh. And some of it's like, eh, uh-huh. you know, I'll set some gadget machines up with this, you know. Yeah, but, right. <laughs> but at the same time, like, that's how I get my reads. I set up gadget machines, I make a read, and that's what I use at work. So I, I don't really have time to sit down and actually make a read for work. So I don't really want to use, you know, pardon the French crap cane. I want to use something that's going to make a read, you know. And so Rigotti is pretty good for the price and for what you get. I'm mm-hmm. happy with it. Yeah. Just have to shed a few tears as you throw some of that cane away. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I learned a few years ago I could either throw my cane away or I can throw my time away. So I'd rather throw my cane away. <laughs> There's no need to be He-Man and say, oh, I can make this into a read. And then you don't. And, you know, you just wasted a bunch of time. Right. It's like, if you know it's not going to make a read, don't, you know, don't be a superhero. Just throw it away. Try again. Did we... Talk about shaper tip and diameter yet? With you? <gasps> oh, I didn't answer that question, did I? So yeah, I mean, shaper tip is kind of whatever you want to use to your personal feel. You know, um, I've been using a Gilbert one forever and ever and ever, and that's kind of a nondescript, you know, like medium size tip, right? Mm-hmm, right? And I tie on pretty long. I tie that one on at like seventy four. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You guys interviewed Sherry Seiler. Yeah, and she talked do. about her reads, and I was like, oh, she put into words, because I was feeling guilty. I'm like, you know, I make really long reads, but to me, they play more up in pitch, because I play in a sharp orchestra. We play sharp. Uh-huh. And um, it's tough to play, you know, up there. Yeah. That was going to be one of my next questions that I heckled oh, yeah? you with, was it's 442, right, in St. Louis? Is that Oh, that's correct? just the opening bid. So yeah, how do you, you know, how do you get so you play, they play these longer reads and how, what, how do you get them up to pitch? Well, I agree with Sherry that mm-hmm. the the longer read you have a smaller aperture at the end, like so you you're not fighting this big tip opening, which right. I can't stand anyway. You know, yeah, I mean I don't want yeah. something that's small and it's going to collapse on me, but something like that that's going to stay nice and small. And uh, I play a loud, and so I I 
I really, really work on getting a nice thin tip. And I leave a bit of bark at the bottom. I think that helps with getting the pitch up also and, and get a little more a little more bite out of the reed, you know. Now the hall I play in is it's really easy to play. So I don't feel like I need to play with a ton of just force, you know, like volume and, and pushing really hard. I, I need I need a lot of color. You gotta have uh uh what we call it like a core to the sound. You gotta have some guts there, but but um just something that's easy and beefy. That's kind of my mantra with the with the gouge and the reeds. It's you know I want something if I'm gonna get tired and start to bite, which I don't like to do, it's not gonna go crazy. And I really love it when I can just let go of the reed and have it just you know, sing for me. Oh, that's the, that's right. That's what it's about. That's the dream. <laughs> that's, that's good living. Sometimes I have a hard time. I feel like when I get an easy read, it, it loses the beef. Yeah. It's yeah. become like a chicken or a fish or a tofu read. <laughs> Where's the beef? <laughs> Where's the beef? Yeah. Where'd it go? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. I'm going to tie some reads at 74 as soon as this interview is over. <laughs> well, I was going back to that, though. I mean, I, you know, and I've tried the Genet tip where you, where you tie on a lot shorter. Yeah. And I like that tip, too. They're really well made. And uh, I've been playing around with, you know, my college tip was this old prototype Kayla minus two, which I thought was so narrow back in the day. And now I have some, you know, maybe it's a little bit different, but I'm like, well, this isn't that narrow after all. And I I made a killer read off the Ruth minus two, which is kind of a, she's kind of a big girl, I guess you could say. I kind of gravitate towards the tips with, it's got some belly, but then it goes straight on the sides, you know? The Adam Shaper tips do that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't like it when they flare at the top. It It's... It's hard to keep that second octave kind of where it needs to be and, and focused, you know, to me. I like the Caleb minus one Ross combination. Yes, yeah. What do you suggest tying on with that that folklore legend of a formula? Mm, I'd say between 73 and 74. It depends on what, what your gouge is doing. So if you're on the heavier sided one, you can tie on a little bit longer. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of, I'm kind of, uh, and I talked with, with Mr. Kilmer about this kind of recently i said you know i'm, I'm kind of on this thing about the sides of the gouge maybe being more important than the middle 
oh. to be honest, you know, mm-hmm. and um, I got to tell you, I went through a journey here. Can I tell you a story? Tell us. Oh, please. Are we ready for story time? That's what we're here for. Okay. So when Peter retired from the orchestra, we were going through his studio upstairs and he says, oh, this is the last of your dad's magic blades. I don't know. He had a thing for like the blades from the 80s or something. I said, oh, okay, great. Well, I've got a blade grinder at home. I can go home and, you know, copy this curve and see what goes on. And I copied the curve and I put it in the machine. I thought, my God, this is a this is a pretty big blade. It's real thin on the sides, you know, and okay. But, you know, if Peter Bowman said this is the blade of blades and, you know, Peter Bowman sounded really good. <laughs> yeah. Why can't I make a read off this? Why do I sound like animal control is about to show up to my house? You know what I mean? It's just like, <laughs> good Lord. Now, I'll, I'll give it credit. It, it, it held the plaque real, real, real tight. But anyway, being stubborn Phil, I tried to work with this blade for like a year or two. And finally, I said, Peter, I said, well, those, you gave me that blade, right? Yeah, yeah. Were your sides real thin back then? He's like, oh, no, they're real heavy. And I was like, what? He's like, oh, yeah. In fact, my favorite gouge was 56 in the middle and 50 on the sides. And I was like, what? He says, oh, every piece of cane made the best read. He said, "That's that was such a great gouge. So I said, well, the one you gave me was not like that. Oh, it's probably just, you know, probably an experiment then. I was like, oh, <laughs> here it was. I'm chasing my tail for years after this. Oh, so I immediately yeah. go home. And I, I went the total opposite direction. I made the smallest blade I could I could make. So I had these big, hefty sides. And it was just too much of a good thing. It was just, hello, I play the oboe. Like, Whoa. <laughs> you know, I like a little balance in there. I don't, you know. So I, I learned a lot. There is a Goldilocks zone to the gouge between the center and sides. And if you've get, you know, if your sides get too thin, at least on the Ross, if it's too thin... Your openings are going to be huge. It's going to be hard to get that read up the pitch. You're mm-hmm. going to be fighting with it like crazy. It's going to be on the thin side, sound sound wise. And if you get thicker and thicker, it's th- it kind of brings it in. And then you get a little thicker, and it kind of helps some of those saggy notes, like G's on some oboes, mm-hmm. low notes on some oboes. You know, it kind of focuses it up. And you get a little bit thicker, and it starts to go that same way as too thin. It starts to get too big again, starts to get hard to get up to pitch. You know, it just drops off in the other direction, but you still have the same kind of problems. Now the sound is really heavy, but you know, what, what do we care about the sound? I've, I've learned over my time, like sound is like at the bottom of the totem pole, right? I want something that's going to feel good and something that's flexible and something that's up to pitch, you know, and then if it feels good, I'm going to get my sound that's in my head to come through the instrument. That's really what I think it ought to come down to for for the gouge to allow you to do that. So my idea is the gouge is pretty much all of it, and the scraping is just kind of the fine tuning. So if I want my reeds to be heavier, well, I can I can go grind a you know a different kind of blade and stick it in the machine. That's really interesting that you should yeah. say that because we just interviewed Titus Underwood and he said mm-hmm. something very similar that the the scraping is just finishing the gouge. You know, you don't have to do anything too fancy and keep it simple. Yeah. I mean, especially a reed maker like me. I'm not a great reed maker. I I fully admit that. I don't care. I'm not ashamed to say that. I just want, you know, I mean, I know what I need to do for my reads to get the job done if I need to make a specific re- read for you know, Mozart versus Mahler versus whatever, you can do that, you know. But, you know, if I've got a bad gouge, man, oh. I, I can't do that. Well, so Don't what be so hard on yourself. Goldilocks side measurement that you mentioned. Oh, well, there's just a range. So <laughs> Just the range, okay. Uh, it's, it, there, yeah, there's like, if you go too thin, you're, you're, it's no good. If you go too thick on the okay. sides, it's no good. But I like to have it kind of where... It's got that beef, like we talk about, but it's also got a little sweetness to it because I think that that's what that's what really works in a hall to project. Like in my hall, you know, you've got to have it needs a little little sugar on top, I guess you could say. But if you had to put a number, like point four eight. Oh, oh, oh! Right, right. <laughs> okay, so I, I'm uh, going back to this. You know, me being me, I'm a wimp. I don't want to go any much more than fifty eight in the middle. 
To me, okay. I'm, I'm like, oh my gosh, these people who gouge at like 60 